Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jared McDonald, head of research here at GRI, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our, today's webinar entitled Exploring the Question of Whether Canadian Pension Funds Should Invest More Domestically. Now, pension risk is one of GRI's key areas of focus. Recently, we convened a number of stakeholders to hear from FISRA CEO Mark White and other experts about the latest risk trends impacting the pension sector. And today we'll be talking about how Canadian pension funds determine their mix of domestic versus international investments, how that mix has changed over the years, and what the data reveals about domestic investment by pension funds, a topic that's been of increasing interest lately. Um, although this is a virtual event and includes participants from across Canada and beyond, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that the Global Risk Institute is situated on the traditional territory of many nations, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Through this land acknowledgement, we want to bring context to the history of our country and the importance of working toward reconciliation in all the ways that we can. Now, before we begin, I'd just like to quickly review a few housekeeping details. Please note that the session is being recorded uh, and that the recording will be shared on the GRI website in a few days. Your microphones have been muted to avoid background noise. We've allocated ample time for questions during the Q&A period at the end of the event. Please submit your questions through the chat uh, and we'll address as many as time allows. And finally, when you exit this webinar, you'll see a prompt for our event survey. Please take a few moments to fill it out. Your feedback is very important to us and helps us to continue to improve our programming. With that, let's begin. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us the lead author of a recent GRI report entitled, Should Canada Require Its Pension Funds to Invest More Domestically? Looking at the breakdown of international versus domestic investments for Canadian pension funds and some of the factors that affect that breakdown. The report is a collaboration between GRI and three leading pension researchers, Keith Ambashir from the University of Toronto and KPA Advisory Services, Chris Flynn from CEM Benchmarking, and we're lucky to have with us today to talk about the report, Sebastian Betermier, Associate Professor with the DeSotel Faculty of Management at McGill University and Executive Director of the International Centre for Pension Management. Sebastian also serves as the coordinator of the finance area at Dave Soutel, faculty director of the McGill International Portfolio Challenge, and is an academic advisor at the Bank of Canada. His research focuses on risk and return, portfolio management and asset pricing, pension funds and retirement systems, household finance, and sustainable finance. His work has appeared in top finance journals has, and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and Bloomberg, among others. He teaches applied investments in pension funds and retirement systems at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. And Sebastian has won the De Soutel Distinguished Teaching Award in 2016 and 2020 and coached the winning team at the Premia International Risk Management Challenge in 2016, 17, and 19. He was also named one of the world's best 40 under 40 business school professors by Poets and Quants in 2017. We'll kick things off with some remarks from Sebastian to be followed by the Q&A. So Sebastian, over to you. Gerard, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is a project, um, as Gerard was mentioning with Keith and uh, Chris Flint from CM Benchmarking, that is motivated by an important question here in Canada, which is, why are we facing a productivity gap uh, nowadays? Uh, there's been a growing productivity gap with the US and, and other OECD countries that has grown that raises important questions about the why. On one hand, perhaps one explanation is that there is decreased level of competitions among Canadian businesses that are reducing the need to innovate and grow. Uh, it could also be potentially that Canadian firms find it more difficult to raise capital from investors. And on that note, a few months ago, close to 100 CEOs of the largest Canadian firms signed an open letter to the government encouraging the government to change the investment rules for pension funds to invest them, to encourage them to invest more in Canada. And the logic goes 
as follows. There's been a significant decline in Canadian pension fund investments in Canadian listed equities from about 28% of the portfolio back in 2000 to less than 4% today. These funds are large. They're about 37% of total institutional savings of in Canada. And so while the decline is hurting the Canadian economy and we need to do something about it, in particular, governments should go and amend the rules governing those funds to encourage them to invest more. Right, that's the, the logic of the letter. Um, in April, the government set up a, a working group led by the former governor of the Bank of Canada to look into this topic. And this is not a topic that is unique to Canada. We see it in the UK. We see it in the Netherlands. Uh, the topic of domestic investments by pension funds is, is increasingly uh, topical uh, today. And so what we're going to do in this paper is, well, take a step back. Uh, before we do anything, take a step back and understand how Canadian pension funds invest domestically. So for that, we're going to go and compare the domestic investments of Canadian pension funds with those of non-Canadian funds. We'll assess the risks and the benefits of the domestic investments, and we're going to go and investigate the barriers to investing in Canada. First, we want to get the facts straight. So we're going to go and get data from CM Benchmarking, a global benchmarking firm based in Toronto, um, and get a better sense of how much the Canadian funds invest domestically. We have a lot of data on listed equity and fixed income. We have about 157 pension funds from Canada, from the UK, from the US. We observe every year for the past 10 years, from 2013 to 2022, we observe whether the, the, the total amount of assets for each fund managed every year in listed equity and in fixed income. And then for each asset class, we know whether there is a dedicated domestic desk, how much is managed by the desk, same for the foreign assets, and also um, how much is managed by the non-dedicated account. Okay, so what we'll do for the equity portfolio, we'll define the domestic share inside the listed equity portfolio for every fund, and then we'll take an average of that across the funds, which is the ratio really of the equity assets managed by the dedicated domestic desk, right, um, to the total equity assets managed by the funds. It's a lower bound in a way of the domestic share because, again, there might be some, some, some domestic assets in a non-dedicated account. We, we do some research on that, and it doesn't seem to be huge, but but at, at, that gives us a good lower bound of what the domestic share should be for the fund. We'll do the same for fixed income. So what is the domestic share inside the fixed income portfolio on average managed by the funds? And then we're also going to look into alternatives. Now, alternatives are tough in order to get data on domestic investments. We don't have data in general on alternative assets. Uh, however, CEM benchmarking did run one-time surveys on the, the largest group of, of pension funds from around the world. It's a smaller group, so we have to be cautious with the numbers, but still, as we'll see in a minute, they're quite uh, informative. And so we'll, we'll work with one-time surveys on the domestic share in private equity in 2018, real estate in 2019, and in infrastructure in 2020. And so that's nice because it gives us um, a multi-asset view of what domestic investments look like. So first, let's look at the domestic share inside the listed equity portfolio. So what you see here is again from 2013 to 2022. You see for the Canadian, UK and US funds, you see the average domestic share for all the funds, as well as for the large funds and large funds we define as funds whose assets under management are above $10 billion USD in 2022. So we see a few things from that table. First, if we look in 2022, the domestic share is high. It's high on average. It's about 18% across all funds and across 16% across the larger funds that presumably would have larger access, easier access to international assets. I say that it's high because if we look at the overall world stock market capitalization, Canada is about 3% of the world, right? So if you look at 18%, that results in a 15% home bias, disproportionate tilt toward the home country. Now, over time, if you go from 2013 to 2022, you do see a decrease. 
a decrease of about 1.34 percent a year. It that that 18 percent used to be 33 percent back in 2013. Now, same for the larger funds. But what's interesting is if you look at across countries, whether it's Canada, UK, or US, you find that the decline is not unique to Canadian to the Canadian funds. It's quite global. In fact, if you were to look at the the Canadian statistics and the UK statistics, they're virtually indistinguishable. Um, the funds actually invest in very similar ways. Okay, and same goes for the US as well. Now, that was for the listed equity portfolio. If we now look at the fixed income portfolio, and again, Canada, UK, US, what's striking is the domestic share is very high. I mean, we're looking at numbers above 80% here. Again, universally high. If you look in the UK or the US, um, it's, 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 it's above 80%. Uh, it has decreased in Canada somewhat from 96 to 88%. Um, and if you look at alternative assets, and again, we have to be cautious with those numbers because the sample size is lower, but we still see some interesting patterns. First, what we find is that the domestic share is highest for real estate. On average, it's also high for infrastructure. It's lowest in private equity. And so you see a pattern here. You find that in general, the domestic share tends to be significantly higher for the what we call the bond like asset classes, like fixed income or real estate or infrastructure, and lowest for the equity like classes, like listed or private equity. If you look across countries, you see that in private equity, the domestic share is particularly high in the US and lower everywhere else. Part of the reason is a lot of the private equity market is based in the US. Now, the assets, the underlying assets may not be in the US, but the intermediaries are very much based in the US. So that explains partly why we see more um, domestic investments in the US on the private equity. On the infrastructure, you find that the domestic share is highest for Australia and the UK, and that's a point I'm going to come back to later. These are countries that have been very proactive in monetizing infrastructure assets, and that partly explains why the domestic share is higher for these countries. And you can see by the same token that it's actually quite low in Canada. So if we were to now just, just summarize those findings, we see really four facts. First, the home bias is quite large and significant on average across the funds. Now, of course, it varies across the funds, uh, but on average, quite large and significant. It's highest in bond-like asset classes. It has decreased over the past decade, uh, but these patterns are global. They're not specific to the Canadian pension funds. Now, one of the key takeaways here is that it is important to look at each asset class separately. We just saw that the home bias varies quite a bit from one asset class to the next. And also over time, the asset mix does change. So once we make comparisons, let's say as we saw in the open letter of the 28% in total assets in listed equities in 2000 down to 4% in 2023, well, part of that decrease actually has to do with a change in the asset mix, irrespective of whether the investments are domestic or foreign. Look here in Canada, what you see here is the change in the asset mix. You see the proportion of total assets in solid in Canadian listed equities on average. Quite a bit from more than. Sorry, everyone, we seem to have lost Sebastian for a second. We'll just try and fix that and we'll be right back. Hello, everyone. We are still trying to get that uh, slight technical issue fixed. 
um, and just give us a few more seconds and hopefully we'll get it uh, fixed very quickly. Hello? It seems I'm back. Yes, Sebastian, we can hear we you. Go. Yeah, we can hear you yes. now, Sebastian. Go ahead. Great. So that means Thank you. Back. So as we saw, sorry for the uh, the, the the connection uh, disconnect. The the there's been a, a shift from listed equities to alternative assets, quite significant. That is not necessarily related to foreign or domestic investments. A good example is uh, Cadillac Fairview. In 2000, Ontario Teachers, one of the larger pension plans here in Canada, purchased Cadillac Fairview, which was publicly listed in the the Canadian market and took it private. Um, it's a large domestic investment, continues to be wholly owned by the firm, uh, but it will no longer show up as a domestic listed investment. It's in their real estate portfolio uh, today. Um, again, this is a shift that is not unique to Canada. We see it in the UK uh, to some extent. We see it in the US to some extent and um, shows the importance again of looking at the domestic share within each asset class. All right, so what do we learn from these facts? First, the funds want domestic investments. Uh, they're not being restricted to own domestic investments here, yet they have a home bias. So clearly that tells us that domestic investments have strategic benefits for the funds. What are those strategic benefits? Well, there is a home courts informational advantage. The funds are based in Canada, they have talent, Local talent here based in Canada, they have a better understanding about the risk return opportunities at home. The assets in Canada also provide a hedge against pension liability risks. Think of interest rate risk, inflation risk, currency risks. All those liabilities are exposed to local inflation, local interest rates. They're paid in Canadian dollars. And so domestic assets naturally have hedging properties against these pension liabilities. And so by having a tilt toward domestic assets, the funds are able to align the risks of their assets to the liabilities. Third, these are assets here in Canada under the local court system. So there's lower risk of expropriation than you would have perhaps if you were to invest on the other side of the world, right? So one key takeaway here is the funds have an interest and, and you don't have to force them to invest domestically. They will naturally want to do so because again, domestic investments carry strategic benefits for the funds. However, that said, there are limits to domestic investing and we see that with the decline in the domestic share over time, especially so in the equity like asset classes and that risk is a concentrated portfolio risk. That risk is higher when the home market is small, more concentrated like Canada, I mean, again, Canada is the size of Texas. Um, and it's more than just a concentration risk on the asset itself. There's also concentration risk when you do take liabilities into account, what we call the double one effect in the sense that um, the local assets will do worst in times of bad local recession. Right, and those are precisely the times when it might be more difficult for the parent sponsor, the public, entities, the public sponsors to go and provide uh, a special contributions to the funds to bring back the funding ratios up. And so the, the for again, from an asset liability perspective on the equity like asset classes, there is that double whammy effect that is an increased risk for domestic investments. We may not see it in Canada today, but we do see it, for example, in Finland. Uh, the Finnish stock market has not performed well lately. The Finnish funds are heavily invested in Finnish securities and have uh, given a warning to the population that, well, Finnish investments are risky on the equity front and are causing a strain on the funds in their ability to deliver income to their pensioners. A third key fact, uh, or I would say lesson from these facts is well, because all the funds are more global today, not just the Canadian funds, all the funds, right? It is not necessarily the case that the Canadian firms will have less access to capital today because the Canadian funds invest less domestically. There might be fewer domestic investments from the Canadian funds, but there should be more investments from foreign investors who are also broadening the portfolio abroad. So we should see 
uh, more investments coming from UK funds, from Australian funds, from Singapore funds, from Middle Eastern funds, right? Um, in a way, what this globalization of portfolios is doing is changing the ownership nature of the, the Canadian firms, not necessarily in and of itself reducing access to capital for the firms. However, because the funds are more global, right, their demand is more elastic in a way, they have more choice. And so what that means is that countries must increasingly compete for capital, much more so than before 20, 30 years ago when there were restrictions on uh, uh, foreign investments. Right today, the funds do have choice, and so that does mean that when other countries are actually quite proactive in bringing capital um, to them, right, uh, it does have some effect on on the level of domestic investments. And so, what that means is that in this global environment, a country receiving less capital must have frictions to domestic investments. Right, there's a reason why capital from foreign investors is not coming in as as much. As it should, and so that now raises the question for us: Well, what are domestic frictions to domestic investing here in Canada? Now, if we want to answer that question, we need to rewind a bit and ask ourselves the question: Well, what is it? What kind of investments are the Canadian pension funds looking for? And to answer that question, we need to remind, uh, rewind a little further and ask: Well, how does the Canadian pension fund business model actually work? When we look at the large funds, the large Canadian funds, these are large defined benefit funds. That means these are funds that are responsible for paying the liabilities, so they're bearing the liabilities on their shoulders. They're responsible for bearing the risks. These funds are public, but they tend to be run at an arm's length legal structure, and they have strong governance. They tend to be run like private funds, uh, very much so here in Canada. Their goal is to provide steady and generous pension to the thousands of members without requiring excessive contributions from the members. How do they do so? By having a long-term focus and a controlled risk-taking approach where any contributions through these long-term investments and earn, earning long-term returns on those investments, they convert contributions to future pensions and max, uh, convert them by a factor of four or five. And so it is important for the funds to continue generating those returns over the long run in order to be able to deliver those pensions. Over time, as you look at the Canadian pension fund business model, you've seen that it has evolved into a very distinct business model. It's distinct in the sense that it is uh, heavily focused on in-house management. If you look at the large plans, about 80% of their assets are internally managed by the, the, the in-house teams. And that reduces cost. We estimate in another research project, it reduces cost by about a third. Those cost savings are then redeployed inside the funds in two ways. First, they're redeployed to do more active management, and they're also redeployed more toward what we would call the strategic asset classes. These are asset classes like real estate, natural resources, infrastructure, private credits. And we say they're strategic because they, multi they, they, they provide multiple benefits to the funds. First, they diversify the asset base. Second, these are asset classes that have particularly good hedging properties against the pension liability risk. They tend to provide steady indexed income streams that look similar to the liability profiles of the funds. And third, these are asset classes that provide opportunities for direct value creation, where the funds actually integrate the value chain and uh, uh, capture the value upstream through development types of projects, and that ultimately feeds into higher risk-adjusted returns. The good example is real estate. What you see here is a map of Toronto the downtown of Toronto, you see the, the, the red square is the financial district of Toronto. The orange square is the south core and neighborhood south of the train station. All the colored buildings in green and blue are buildings that are currently or have been directly owned by the funds. All the ones in greens are the ones where the funds have been proactive in retrofitting the fund to higher LEED standards. And that clearly shows you a very high level 
of active engagement domestically in the real estate asset class, um, a class that again diversifies against the asset base, hedges against some of the pension liability risk, and where the funds through their active engagement are able to earn higher risk adjusted returns. And here's where the friction is. The friction is that many strategic assets in Canada are not for sale. If you look at Pearson Airport, top left, Port of Vancouver, bottom left, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, top right, or some of the Hydro Quebec uh, power utility stations, these are all government owned assets that are not for sale. But these types of assets, are available for purchase abroad. Think of Heathrow Airport in London, that is owned partly by the Canadians. Think of the Eurostar connecting Paris to London, that again is owned partly by the Canadians. Look at the North Connect Tunnel, that's the deepest tunnel in Australia, in, uh, in Sydney, again owned partly by the Canadians. Pattern Energy, bottom right, one of the largest renewable energy providers in the US, again owned by the Canadians. These are assets classes that the funds are looking for that are not available in Canada, but they are available abroad. And so that contributes to the decline in domestic investments. But so that means that policymakers, while they face a hard dilemma, they can withhold some of these strategic assets, but in doing so, they will lose capital from the pension funds. Or they can force the funds then to invest in the, the, the other non-strategic Canadian assets, but in doing so, they're going to upset the risk return calibrations done by the funds, which ultimately will result in the financial loss to the pensioners. Now, there are solutions. There is an alternative solution, which is to monetize strategic asset classes. That, if it's done well, is a win-win, because for the governments, it provides access to large forms of capital directly from the pension funds. And then for the funds, it provides access to strategic assets that they are looking for. But if you want to do it well, there's three hurdles that you have to overcome. One is a lack of scale. The second is a lack of public support. And a third is a lack of economic viability. Now, I'm going to be running out of time, so I'm not going to go too much in depth, but I'm happy to come back over these points in the, in the Q&A part. Scale is an essential source of value generation for the funds. Some of the large strategic assets do provide scale benefits. The energy transition also provides opportunities for scale, but they are a hurdle. When you look at most public-private partnerships in Canada, they usually lack the scales, and in some cases, the market is fragmented. Um, just look at the case of real estate, all of the activities done by the funds very much focus on the downtown area, on the big towers that immediately provide the scales. As soon as you move away from the downtown, the activity is much less uh, pronounced. And so there is a need here for operating platforms where uh, that can consolidate some of these assets and then provide that ability for scale directly to the funds. Public support is a big issue when we're looking at these monetization initiatives. Uh, there is not a ton of buy-in by the public for projects that do require a user fee. Think of highway tolls. Uh, there's a fear as well that if the government is going to negotiate with private actors, the government might get too little from the sale, and so it might not be a fair deal. We've had a past privatization experiences that have been criticized. Think of the Hydro One here in Ontario. So it is critical if you are going to push forward monetization initiatives that we do have a clear regulatory structure uh, to protect the public, that there is a clear communications about the proceeds of the sale, that they will be used to develop other future infrastructure projects to the benefit of the population. Potentially some pain share, gain share provisions that will provide financial upside to the government. And a very clear competitive bidding process that ultimately allows the private sector to reveal through the bidding process what the true value of the deal is, even if the government itself may not necessarily have a, a good sense of the value of the project. Transition assets also can be difficult for public buy in particular for the pension funds. Investing in transition assets that may not be green today, but that become green down the road are politically sensitive. Um, every time we're discussing fossil fuel investments, immediately it is uh, creating a lot of criticism from various stakeholders. 
Um, for that, it is critical that we push forward a transition finance taxonomy, such as the one recently proposed by the SPAC, one that has been uh, has has uh, inspired the, Canadian, the, the the Australian actually government to act, uh, but that we still do not have in uh, in Canada as at the moment. And third, um, there is the economic viability issues for the funds. Uh, we do have some fairly lengthy permit processes here in Canada. We do have a need for policy stability and planning processes in order again to, to make these long-term investments viable for the long-term investors. Uh, blended finance solutions may be the way to go, building on the, the, the setup of the Canadian Infrastructure Bank and the, the Canada Growth Fund. We can talk more about uh, potentially case studies from Australia, from India, but I'm gonna conclude for now. Um, the key takeaways from this research is one, if you look at the Canadian pension funds and you look at the current levels of investment, they are highly invested in Canada. There is a significant home bias, especially in the bond-like asset classes. That home bias represents a careful calibration of the risk and benefits of the pension funds. Second, when you look at the dynamics over time, all asset owners, including the Canadians, but the, the foreign investors as well, all asset owners have become more global investors today, especially so in the equity-like asset classes, and that is for risk mitigation purposes. The globalization of portfolios puts pressure on governments today to compete for capital, perhaps more pressure than it has ever done so in the past. And when we look at the frictions to domestic investing, there is a big friction that comes out, and that is the lack of strategic assets. Um, if we were to put regulatory pressures right away to invest domestically without addressing that friction, that will hurt pensioners and it will not solve the underlying problem. There is a win-win outcome if asset monetization is done correctly. And not only will that bring capital naturally from the pension funds, but potentially from a much larger pool of international investors. And so again, uh, this is a win-win that in our view uh, should be pushed further. And uh, uh, as and in, in the months to come, as we are uh, discussing about uh, future assets, uh, opportunities to encourage domestic investments here in Canada. So I'll stop here and uh, I would love to uh, answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That was a great overview of the report and its findings. Um, and I and I think it's it's wonderful to see kind of insight and data coming to some of these risk and public policy questions. That's exactly where GRI wants to be. And so thank you very much for for completing that research and also for coming to talk to us about it today. So we're going to dive a little deeper with a few uh, questions from the audience. I'll open it up with one quick question. Uh, please do submit in the chat your questions. We've already got a bunch of questions, Sebastian, so I, I, I'm not too worried that there'll be some robust discussion, but maybe let me kick it off. So uh, the multi-billion dollar question is whether Canadian pension funds should invest more of their assets in Canada. Um, so you and your co-authors argue that the pension fund shouldn't be mandated to do that, but you believe if the right opportunities are provided, they will invest more in Canada. So do you think the changes that you're suggesting today could make a material uh, difference in this question that so many are asking today about whether Canadian pension funds should invest more in Canada? I believe so. Uh, when we're looking at opportunities for scale, we're looking at large investments. If, if, if we were to monetize Pearson airports, other big infrastructure properties, look into the energy transition, there is opportunities for large scale investments that will immediately have an impact. I think equally important is the fact that the more appealing we make our own assets, we're not just bringing the Canadian pension funds interest into the game, we're bringing a much larger pool of international capital. It's interesting when we look at the, the, a lot of the discussion today has really focused on why the pension funds in Canada have invested less domestically. To me, the more interesting question that we should ask is why don't we have more international capital here in the country? Because that's the canary in the coal mine. Uh, these funds have also gone abroad. Are they avoiding Canada? 
And if so, why is this? Because if that's the case, that's a massive opportunity that we are missing out on. And this is where the, the low hanging fruit is. That's great. Okay, let's let's turn to our uh, our participants. Uh, the first question we received said, given the high levels of immigration in Canada, there should be a strong demand for new infrastructure investments. What's impeding pension investment in new versus existing strategic assets? I think it's a, it's a great question. And indeed, the large amounts of immigration are naturally fueling demand for large scale domestic investments. When we put that to practice, a few things come out. One is, we need the right infrastructure partnerships to make it happen. Uh, it's not clear that necessarily the funds will work on the greenfield investment itself. When you look at the success of other countries that have brought in very successfully foreign capital, and, and I'm thinking in particular of India and Australia that have done a lot of efforts to monetize their assets and bring in capital, a lot of those efforts that the funds don't come in and develop directly themselves. They operate. So the government first developed in the green field and then sells over to the pension funds on could be a 30 year, 50 year lease or so to operate the assets afterwards. Um, the asset is already built. So that reduces part of the risk. Um, it is critical and I was alluding to it earlier. It is critical that we are able to align the scale, the public supports and the economic viability. So if you look at what happens, for example, in Australia or in India, those initiatives have been able to align these three components. There's a government a partnership that immediately provides scale. There is, uh, for example, in the case of Australia, a clear communication effort to show what the monetization will be used for. Is it going to be used to build the Sydney Metro? So it is clearly filling a societal need. That's critical because otherwise, who knows where the, the sale, the, the proceeds of the sales are going to go to. And uh, in, in, in both cases, in India and Australia, we do see evidence of the public uh, partner providing blended finance support. Uh, for example, in the US, TIFIA is a great example of a partnership where that makes use of the low cost of capital from the government. And so what happens is, uh, a private developer can have access to loans from TIFIA, loans that are at the same rate as treasury bond yields and flexible amortization terms throughout the length of the project. So that reduces uncertainty a lot. It allows the private partner to benefit from the lower cost of capital from the governments. And uh, that in turn encourages domestic investments when the need is there as we do have here in Canada. Great. Um, you've talked a lot about infrastructure. So one of the questions from our participants is, can you elaborate on how much better the risk return ratio is for infrastructure um, and by how much and, and how will that affect future investments and contributions? It's hard to quantify because infrastructure is a big word for a lot of different types of investments, whether we're looking at highways or nuclear power plants or, but in general, what you do find, especially when the Canadians invest directly, uh, you find evidence that these types of private projects end up again, generating fairly high risk adjusted returns relative to public benchmarks. Uh, and we've done that in the real estate asset class, so not for infrastructure, but we've done it carefully in the real estate asset class where we have seen evidence of about 1.5% net return above and beyond the benchmark for the direct investments of the pension funds in the real estate space. Um, and these are investments that typically align with the risk of the liability. So again, we don't necessarily want to think just in terms of the returns itself relative to the benchmark, but how it fits in the broader portfolio picture. And if you have assets, that have streams of cash flows that are long term and indexed to index to to inflation that naturally brings down the gap between assets and liabilities. And so from from that sense of from that metric, um, these types of investments can be quite beneficial, which is why, again, we, we refer to them as strategic types of assets from the perspective of the funds. So um, we will come back to infrastructure because there's a lot more questions about infrastructure, but stepping away from infrastructure for a second, what are other types of um, things that the government could do to attract investment? Uh, and are there other uh, strategic assets other than just infrastructure? 
natural resources is a great example. Uh, we have a, another research project where we look at case studies of direct investments by the large funds. PSP, one of the large Canadian funds, has revitalized a sugar cane plantation in Hawaii into a large scale diversified agricultural hub. So now we're in the natural resource space. Um, these are projects where, again, the, 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 the fund is able to get all the value added from the transformation of the deal and then having access to an asset class that is, uh, again, having the right types of properties from the funds in terms of the long term cash flows and the indexation of the, what the, the exposure to inflation from these, these commodities. Um, again, it is critical in all these cases to be able to generate scale, especially for the large funds. Um, you do see it, especially in more fragmented markets, the use of operating platforms that provide access to scale. And you see it in infrastructure, you see it in natural resources, you see it in real estate. Um, that need for scale is critical. Um, another question about the data over time. Um, and this question is, um, does the data show that global investments in Canada kind of, you talked quite a bit about it. This isn't just about Canadian pension fund or institutional investor investment uh, in Canada, but it's also potentially about global institutional investor investment in Canada. Does the data show that the global investments in Canada has decreased over the years? Um, and if so, would that would that would that further the argument that this isn't an issue caused by the pensions and puts a bit more of the onus on policymakers instead of the funds? We don't have that information. Mm. So what we do see is uh, your dedicated domestic desk and the dedicated foreign desk. Uh, the foreign desk. We don't see the exact allocation, so I'm not able as of now to 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 be able to say, for, especially from the foreign investors, how much they're investing in Canada versus the US versus Australia versus the UK. So in that sense, that is an interesting statistic to 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 uh, to get. Uh, and I agree with you. Uh, information about that statistics will be quite informative, in particular about uh, the point that uh, we may not have as much capital as as we should, given the potential and the size of, uh, of our economy. Given a, 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 a real time question came in and just as you were talking, um, are there things kind of given the work that you've done and what you've seen and particularly in other jurisdictions, um, are you, there things that you think Canadian policymakers could do to create a more conducive environment to attract more investment, not only from the Canadian pension funds, but also from the other um, uh, other inst uh, global institutional investors. Yeah, so a great example is India. Have a look at the National in Investment and Infrastructure Fund. It's called the NIIF. It's it's a very interesting structure what they've put up with several years ago. I think it was, if I recall, it was created in 2015, 2016 or so. And it's a structure where essentially the government is, uh, think of it as a, as a platform where you have uh, co-investors from around the world. So we have a few Canadians investing there, a few Australians as well. Um, the government has a 40, what is it, 49, 48% equity ownership of the platform. They immediately provide scale through their large investments. Uh, the, the local pension funds in India have an additional 2 to 3%. The foreign investors, including the Canadians, have about a 48% uh, structure. So you have an interesting format where the... Uh, the uh, domestic ownership is, is about 50%. So from a strategic uh, security reasons, that is important. But from a private sector setting, the private sector also have a majority ownership. So it's, it's a clever structure in that sense. And um, what's actually quite important for the funds is you have the ability to connect directly with high level government officials on that platform. So not only do you get the scale from the government, but you also get guidance moving forward about what the landscape looks like. And that's critical because, again, if you're thinking of it as long-term investors, those pension funds, it is critical to have stability, regulatory stability about what's going to happen next, especially if you're going to put billions of dollars into an investment. And so that stability and that guidance has proven I mean, extremely valuable to the funds in investing more, let's say, in India. Um, and 
uh, the ability to provide novel infrastructure projects that feel a societal need has given implicit support from the population. So again, the government has been able to combine scale, economic viability through especially uh, in addition to a uh, and public support. So again, you're, you're getting those conditions where the government can come in and help and uh, uh, create those conditions for the foreign investors to come in. So it sounds like there's some great lessons from India um, that we can learn. Um, one question from our participants is, are, are there some specific lessons from the experience in Canada of the Canadian government or provincial governments monetizing strategic assets? You mentioned the difficult experience of Hydro One. Are, the, are there good examples? Would you include the 407 in that list of successful PPP? Like, you know, a, any thoughts on that? I mean, you're, you're raising a good point. What are those examples? There's very few in Canada. Um, the Hydro One became a hot political, uh, hot potato topic, I guess that's how you would call it. Um, the the four seven is, is is one investment, but we just saw an announcement from the Ontario government, what is it, a few months ago, saying they would push to ban the tolls on, on all the highways. So this is not necessarily a, sending a signal to the funds that the government is willing to go there. Uh, in my view, a successful example is what has happened to CDPQ in Quebec and the development of the Réseau Express Metropolitan. It's quite impressive actually how um, efficient the development of this metro system has been. It started in 2015, 2016. Um, CDPQ created a whole subsidiary called CDPQ Infra um, in partnership with the government of Quebec, in partnership with the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. It's a, it's, 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 it's a big investment. Um, it has started already being in operations. Um, and there's very clever aspects to that deal. So one of them, for example, is uh, the CDPQ not only has a priority equity ownership on to the deal, but they've also been able to raise revenues through equity of the development around the platform, around the stations. So here's an example of a public private partnership that has in less than a decade developed uh, a big new metro system in, in Montreal. You, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges in transition investing. So one of the questions from our, our participants is for the energy transition, market and revenue streams may not exist. So for example, building retrofits, EV charging. Should the pension funds and their deal-making teams work with governments and other stakeholders to make markets, develop them and achieve scale? The yes, uh, um, the you have several opportunities on the energy transition where there is room for a successful partnerships, and the the green retrofit is a great example. I mean, look at the downtown of Toronto. The the majority of LEED platinum buildings. I forgot the exact numbers today. There must be around twenty two, twenty five platinum buildings. The highest level of lead. Uh, I think 17, 18 of them have been built directly by the funds. And the funds have been able to monetize uh, to, 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 to make these investments successful because you have uh, natural energy efficiencies and you have uh, renters, tenants that are willing essentially to pay higher rents to have these higher quality types of buildings. Um, what becomes very difficult right away is you get a fragmented market where once you move away from these downtown towers, you have many owners, you have many types of properties, and at that point, the savings are not necessarily as crystal clear to, to monetize, at least in the short run. And so this is where potentially you can have the development of an operating platform, and there's some being developed in Toronto as we speak, um, where with the use of blended finance by the government, uh, there is an opportunity to uh, bring in capital from the private sector in, in, in an efficient way over the long term. Uh, you, uh, we, you, you kind of sort of went over very quickly the Australia case study. Um, yeah. Maybe talk a little bit more. I, I think folks found the India example you talked about quite interesting. You know, what success has Australia had um, uh, and, and what can Canada learn from them? So the Australia case is very interesting because they've been able to monetize a lot of their assets and provide scale. Uh, also provide situations where there is economic viability for the funds. Uh, they've set up in 2016 as well or so what is called the Asset Recycling Initiative. It's interesting when you look at the name Asset Recycling. So immediately 
that that shows uh, a purpose to the the initiative about recycling the, the the funds for the development of another asset. So what's happening is uh, this works between the, the it's an initiative between the federal government and the provincial government, where the provincial governments have an incentive, a financial incentives from the federal to monetize some of their assets, like let's say the Port of Melbourne to monetize it. Um, there's a clear purpose to these initiatives. So for example, uh, some of these in, let's say New South Wales, the purpose is to build a metro in Sydney. So that immediately puts a very tangible goal next to the monetization initiative. The provinces, if I recall correctly, uh, benefit from a subsidy from the government in order to uh, conditional on, 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 on monetizing those assets, uh, uh, a subsidy of about 15% from the transfer from the federal government um, to incite them to monetize these assets. So now you're aligning incentives where uh, the provinces have an incentive to work with the private sector together. Um, they've been careful in developing clear contractual terms to make sure that you have a price regulation to make sure that you have a, um, regulations on the jobs, the workforce, the compositions of the board and so forth to ensure that the public is protected. And so you have, again, a good example of initiatives to build public supports, to gain scale and to make the projects economically viable uh, for the private sector. And so again, that, that it's that alignment of the of, of these three dimensions where the Australians have been successful in, in that respect. Um, I don't know a follow up question on transition. Not sure if there are any insights from some of the foreign jurisdictions as well, but um, uh, given Canada's competitive edge in oil and gas, how do the pension funds help fund low carbon industrial technology to help decarbonize oil and gas and grow these technology companies globally? Uh, so the, the part of the transition taxonomy actually looks at existing oil and gas holdings and using carbon capture to uh, <clears throat> help to decarbonize that sector and use the proceeds for greener future ventures. Uh, one of the leading actually carbon capture was developed in Calgary, carbon engineering, if I, if I recall. So you have opportunities there to decarbonize the existing oil and gas sector. Um, we do have another problem that we face, though, that needs to be addressed is uh, our companies in Canada that we develop, when they start to grow and scale up, that's when they leave. And we have a scaling issue here that we need to address um, because many of these companies go south. And uh, it's, it's critical to address it, especially in that transition types of economy that will be useful, not just in Canada, but also in the US and, and, uh, and other economies. One of our one of our participants is asking a sort of a related question to our topic today, which is how sustainable is the Canadian pension model over the next two decades, given the demographic shift in the increasing number of pensions requiring income in Canadian dollars in Canada? So it's 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 a good question. Um, we've done research on the sustainability of the Canadian model and how performing it is, and it's actually quite remarkable when you look at the performance of the large Canadian funds. We are perhaps arguably the only country in the world that is able to, or one of the only countries in the world that is able to sustain consistently a defined benefit system. Uh, and we're doing it where the funds essentially are bearing the risks, right? And paying off a steady income stream to the pensioners. And we're able to do it because the funds are able to act independently, that's critical, and act long-term. Uh, we don't have strict solvency ratios that require the funds to uh, be fully funded on a pure solvency basis at all points in time. The funds are allowed to take risks. They are allowed to think long term. Um, so we did a study on this and we looked at the performance of the funds over the past 5, 10, 20 years. And systematically what we saw is that the large Canadian funds outperformed their global peers on multiple dimensions, on the value added, on the overall portfolio risk return results, and also on asset liability types of metrics. So the funds were able not only to perform well in terms of the assets, but also to hedge assets and liabilities at the same time. And part of that is precisely that tilt toward the private strategic asset classes, where they are able to diversify the asset base, hedge against the liabilities, 
and generate value added by integrating the value chain. And so you have funds, the funds, Essentially, think of it this way. You have a situation where the members would, let's say, contribute about 10% of their income. Employers would contribute an additional 10%. So we're looking at 20% of savings in total. The funds are able to convert all that through the higher returns into a pension, roughly speaking, equivalent to 80% of final salaries forever indexed to inflation. All the funds today are fully funded. That's actually quite remarkable given how... Uh, much we've seen the DB system move away uh, and being transitioned to the DC system. And so in that sense, I'm actually quite optimistic about the fund's ability to continue delivering those pensions. But for that, it is critical that they are able to continue keeping that independence and fine tuning that careful risk return calibration. Great. So maybe one last question, and I'll cheat a little bit by combining two of the questions uh, that, uh, that have come in. Um, you opened up by talking about the productivity question in Canada. So maybe comment a little bit about, you know, uh, how the things that you talked about today, you know, do you think they will go some way towards solving the productivity question? And then the related question that I'll sneak in as well is, um, I know you've only just published a paper, but you've been involved in lots of discussions. What has the response been? kind of generally to the people you've been talking about to the suggestions and the insights in the paper? I'll start with the second. So far, we've seen a lot of positive responses and a broad agreement uh, about one, the value of keeping, allowing the funds to remain independent and act in the best interest of their members and focusing on the need to make our own assets more appealing to investors, both Canadian funds and foreign investors. So, so far, all the responses that we've heard have been very positive in that sense and, and, and actually reinforcing that argument. In terms of the productivity, I mean, of course, if we can get more private business investment in Canada, that, that, that can only help. Uh, um, especially when you're looking at some of the investments managed by the funds, they're actually quite efficiently run. Um, I would say especially so if we can push more private investments in primary markets where you know that the capital investments by the fund will translate into real business investments, that is uh, where the impact will be the greatest. I'm not convinced that investing more in listed equities that have already been issued will have the same impact. So you have more of a transfer of wealth to existing shareholders. Um, and that actually raises, in my view, an important point that I raised at the very beginning, but we haven't discussed. And that's up for another whole research study. <laughs> to what extent is our lack of productivity here in Canada the result of a lack of competitiveness? Right? So to what extent do we have a not enough competition inside our businesses here in Canada that are stifling innovation in that sense? And that's particularly important because if you have already a bit of a an industrial organization that is not conducive to innovation, fueling more financial capital might just, might just feed into a transfer of wealth to existing shareholders without necessarily uh, resulting in more private investments at the real business level. So here, the, the, the primary sector is critical. Um, those investments in the, 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 the strategic asset classes that we've talked is along those lines. And uh, clearly, I think we all agree that the more private investments we can attract, not only from our funds, but 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 from foreign investors in general, uh, the better for the country. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Um, I want to thank Sebastian for his time and his insights and thank all of you for your participation. Of course, the paper is available on our website, so please go and download it if you haven't already.